here. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Lauren Ross from the University of Irvine. She's got a, uh, turn that off. Um, over there. Lauren Ross from Irvine, she's a associate prof in the Department of Logic and Philosophy of Science. She got a PhD from Pittsburgh and also a medical degree from UC Irvine. So it's an interesting combination. Um, Lauren, as you may have gathered from her title, has been working a lot on um, causation and explanation and what those actually mean um, in, in neuroscience, but also more broadly in science in general. Um, so it's very um, engaging ideas on how to com com communicate that so it, it makes sense and that we can agree on this for language that's used to convey um, causation and so on in neuroscience. Um, so with that, I'll let Lauren take over and rock and roll. Sounds great. Thank you so much. And special thanks to Randy and Kelly for all of the organization and the uh, invitation to be here today. It's a real pleasure. This talk is on types of causation in neuroscience. It's focused in particular on types of causes, causal relationships, and causal systems. A helpful place to start with this work is with causation. Causation is a topic that receives a ton of attention and in many different fields. It receives a lot of attention in science, of course, in philosophy, in legal contexts, and in everyday life. Why is this the case? Why does causation receive all of this attention and in so many different fields? A first reason for this has to do with explanation in the philosophy of science, in theory of science, and I think even in scientific contexts, it's often suggested that one of the most important things that scientists do is they provide explanations. Um, it's also often suggested that most, if not all of these explanations are causal. The basic idea here is that causes explain their effects. So when a scientist picks out the target that they're interested in, the explanatory target of focus, the way that they give an explanation for that target is by identifying the single cause or the set of causes that work together to produce that outcome. Here's a, here's a simple example of this. Um, Huntington's disease, right? Uh, pretty simple example in the sense that if you want to give an explanation for Huntington's disease, this involves appealing to the cause or set of causes that produce it, the very least a kind of trinucleotide repeat. Um, basic idea, causes are factors that explain their effects. If you wanna give an explanation of something, you need to know the causes that produce it, right? So if explanation is one of the most important things that scientists do, and it involves causality, right? It's these explanations are causal, you need to know something about causation. Second reason for our interest in, cause, in causation. Oh boy. Prediction. <laughs> uh, if you know that a factor is the cause of some outcome, a main cause, a stable cause, you can often use that causal factor to predict the occurrence. So of course, if we know that this trinucleotide repeat is a main cause of Huntington's disease, we can use the identification of this in patients to predict their likelihood of getting this disease. Third reason for our interest in causation, and probably the most important one, control. We don't just wanna sit back and give fancy accurate explanations and predictions of stuff in the world. We want to actually do something about that stuff. We wanna change things and make things better, right? Causes are essential for this because they're factors that give us control over outcomes, right? Of course, we're very interested in this in medicine because we don't just want to explain and predict diseases. We want to treat them. We want to prevent them. That involves control. So causation is essential for this. A fourth reason, um, uh, this is a list that's not exhaustive, involves attributing responsibility and blame. Um, we see this in neuroethics context. We see, it, we see it in legal context. If there's a car crash on the street and you wanna know what the main cause of that crash is, this is because we're often interested in figuring out who or what is to blame. What's responsible for that crash? Is it a driver who wasn't paying attention, a manufacturing issue with the car, or a problem with the light signal in the road? 
So in many cases, looking for and identifying the main cause or set of causes for an outcome is important to us because it allows us to identify what's responsible and to blame for that outcome. These are four main causation related goals. In the philosophy of science literature, it is accepted and understood that if you're interested in reaching these four main causation related goals, there's a very important first step that you need to take. The first step is you need to define causation, right? You need to say what it is that captures the kind of characteristic or hallmark features of causality, right? Um, when you have these hallmark or characteristic features, you can use them to distinguish true genuine causal relationships from everything else, from stuff that's non-causal and from mere correlations. So one thing we've all heard is correlation isn't causation. If you wanna say why this is the case, you need some kind of definition or account of causality. There are many different accounts or definitions of causation that are present in the philosophical literature. Here are three main examples. We have regularity accounts. These were popularized by Hume, also Mackey. Connected process accounts is a second view. These are discussed by Wesley Salmon. And a third account, which is the most commonly used account of causation in philosophy of science, are interventionist accounts. Main proponent of these is Jim Woodward. There are many other accounts of causation in the philosophy of science literature. Um, and some of them get more attention than others. Now, while it's often appreciated that if you want to reach these four main causation related goals, this is the first step you need to take. What isn't appreciated is that there's a really important second step that we need to take before we can have access to these goals. And this second step involves not just defining causation, but capturing distinctions within causation. The idea here is that there are different causal varieties or types of causation. There are relationships that are genuinely causal, legitimately causal, that can all meet the same definition of causation, but still differ in really extreme and important ways. These causal relationships and the causal relationships that we find studied by scientists and that we find in the world have various features that are distinct from what makes them causal. They're distinct from the definition of causation. And these capture how they're unique from one another. And they matter for causal reasoning and for these four main causation related goals. In order to give a little bit more of a motivation for there being important distinctions within causation or types of causation, consider some of the causal language that we find in neuroscience and in neurobiology, language that scientists use when they refer to causation in the world. One example that we find often in medical contexts is a distinction between causes that are predisposing for a disease versus exciting or causes that are triggers. Um, uh, we also see this, of course, in contexts where there's some kind of interest in a trigger for a disease versus some kind of environmental factor that predisposes. Second distinction that we find often in genetics is reference to genes that are drivers for a disease versus mere passengers. Another distinction is causes that are um, proximal for a disease versus distal for a disease. If you think of a causal process on a linear chain, you have the effect at the very end. Proximal cause is very close to this. Distal cause is much further upstream. So this is just some of the language that's used to capture different types of causes. There are many other different types of causal, causal systems and causes. Another distinction is how causes are organized with respect to each other. They can be organized on a linear chain in a bow tie type configuration. Many causes all converge on a single shared node and then diverge from that, right? The single knot of the bow tie. Causes can be organized in feedback loops, positive or negative. 
Yet another set of causal concepts and terms that we find are complicated terms that refer to more complex causal systems, terms like mechanism, pathway, and cascade. So part of what I'm suggesting here is that if you look at the language that scientists use when they refer to causal relationships and systems in the world, we see a richness, we see a very colorful language. And part of what I'll suggest is this is capturing important types of causal varieties and causal diversity in the world and in their work. So there's two main questions that I'll focus on in the rest of this talk today. The first is how do we capture these? How do we provide the right kind of framework for understanding these different causal varieties? And second, why do they matter? Why should you care about them? Why do they matter for these four main causation related goals and for scientists in general? So with this background in mind, the plan for my talk today involves three main steps. In the very first part of this talk, I will give a very small mention of the account of causation that I'll rely on in this work. I'll then very quickly move on to capturing different types of causal varieties, start giving us examples of these right away. In the second part of this talk, I'll provide an analysis for capturing these distinctions, how I think they should be understood. I'm going to suggest that this is very different from defining causation, right? Um, and I'll show why. And in the third part of this talk, and really uh, sprinkled all throughout the talk, I'm going to say why these distinctions matter. I'll suggest that they matter for causal reasoning, for capturing different types of explanation in science, that these different causes give us very different types of control over the world, and that it matters for science communication, how causation, causal understanding is communicated to various audiences. So to start things off, causation, what is it? What's the, what is the definition of causation or the account of causation that I rely on in this work? In this work, and really in a lot of philosophy of science right now, a common way of understanding causation is in terms of control. This is an account of causation that is sometimes referred to as the interventionist account. It is uh, an account that has been popularized and discussed by Jim Woodward in this book, Making Things Happen. He um, articulates it in lots of detail. It's in many of his other publications and many other philosophers of science have picked this up and used this in their work. The idea is that X is a cause of Y if an intervention on X that changes it, that changes its values, gives you control over Y. So causes are factors that give you control. Um, to be a little bit more precise, it's actually hypothetical control. Because in many cases, we identify something as a cause even though we can't actually intervene on it. And that's fine on this account. It doesn't limit things, it doesn't limit viewing things as causal just if we can intervene on them. What it says is that if you could intervene on that factor and you changed it, it would give you control. This makes sense of historical causes, Yesterday, I stepped on a banana peel and I fell, right? There's no way to intervene on something that happened in the past. On this account, what it means to say that that's causal is if you could have intervened and I hadn't stepped on the banana peel, I would not have fallen. Um, this makes sense of um, causal claims that we make in science where we don't have a technological intervention yet on the cause or where we can't intervene on it for ethical reasons, but we still have lots of other information that tell us that if we were to intervene on that gene and change it, we would get control. Of course, there's a lot more to say about this, but this is interventionism in a nutshell. There are many advantages of this account of causation. It makes a lot of sense of causal reasoning in many different scientific contexts. It's essentially built off of scientific work and how scientists experiment, um, intervene on the world and other types of methods they use for extracting causal information, even from observations. Second, it's consistent with a lot of work in cognitive psychology that studies how humans, how scientists study causation in the world. It's called causal cognition in this work. And Woodward and a number of other philosophers who work on causation, they're very much working with cognitive psychologists. And this account right, is uh, held to the standard of being consistent with scientific work on how humans causally reason about the world. Third, another advantage 
it captures the distinction between cause and correlation. This might seem kind of uh, silly in the sense that, you know, of course we want our account of causation to do this, but many accounts of causation struggle to do this for simple cases. So here's an example of a common cause scenario. You have air pressure and it's a cause of two different things, the barometer reading and storm occurrence. The barometer reading and storm occurrence are correlated together, but of course we don't view them as causal. Uh, there's a regularity here, right? Problem for Hume, problem for a regularity account, but we don't view the correlation between the barometer and the storm as causal. The interventionist account captures why. A reason why, maybe the reason why, is because if you intervened on the barometer and you change that dial, you get no control over storm occurrence, right? But air pressure definitely gives you control over both of these outcomes, right? Causes are factors that give you information about control. And if they were intervened on, they give you control over the outcome. So very nicely captures this distinction. There is a lot of work in this area, um, of course, well beyond uh, Woodward's work. And there's a lot of work that's done in this area by philosophers of science who are here at SFU. Um, one of them is Nick Fillion. Two others are Kino Chow and Holly Anderson. There's a lot of work in this area that focuses on causation in the life sciences. Holly works on this, work on causation in the social sciences by Kino, and work on explanation in general, whether it fits a standard causal pattern or others. And this is seen in the work that Nick has done. Now, to say that causation needs to meet this control feature, it's pretty minimal. It's a pretty minimal claim, right? Causes are factors that need to give you some kind of control. Well, when we want to capture causal reasoning and causal stuff in the world, we want a whole lot more than this, right? We want to know what kind of cause we have beyond it gives us some control over the effect. That's another way to think of what this second step and what we need to do next, right? Um, in other words, a definition of causation allows you to distinguish causal from not causal, but now we've got the causal stuff and it's different in all sorts of important and interesting ways. So what are some of those ways? Um, we'll move on now to some types of causation in neuroscience, neurobiology, biology, and we'll start by going molecular. Um, I'll give an example of a causal system in order to illustrate certain types of causal distinctions or types of causation. So we've got a gene here. The gene produces a very particular enzyme. This enzyme produces a metabolite. It operates at this metabolic step, step in a metabolic pathway. So in this diagram so far, we have metabolite two. It's got two different causes. Metabolite one is the upstream substrate, and you've got this enzyme processing this chemical conversion, right? And then if we look at a bigger picture, understanding of causal entities in this system. Here you have a more detailed picture. The very top, this sequence of steps in a metabolic pathway. At every step, you have an enzyme that's involved and that enzyme has a gene that is producing it. You could find a diagram like this, right? Diagrams like this are shown often in publications and in, uh, and in books and in the science literature. Of course, the arrows in this diagram are representing causal relationships. However, these causal relationships are not all created equal. One thing the diagram is not showing us is that these causal relationships differ in really important ways. What are some of these ways? A first way that these causal relationships differ is they differ with respect to the speed or the time scale on which they unfold. Causes are factors that differ with respect to the speed with which they produce their effects. So if we look at this gene to enzyme causal relationship, it takes place on the time scale of minutes. If we look at the enzyme to metabolite causal relationship, alternatively, this is operating on a much faster time scale, nanoseconds, right? An average enzyme can produce on the order of 3 million metabolites per second. Scientists refer to this distinction, right? They'll say things like genes and enzymes exert their control on different timescales. Speed in this sense is 
relative to some time scale or interest. So it doesn't make sense to say that a cause is just fast or slow. It's fast or slow relative to a time scale that you have chosen. So this gene to enzyme causal relationship is very slow if you compare it to the time scale of nanoseconds. And it's super fast if you compare it to a geological time scale, right? On which, you know, rocks are formed, you have mountain formation, or if you compare it to the spread of COVID through the population. Why is speed a distinction within causation that matters? A first reason for why this is a causal type or a causal variety that matters is it matters for explanation. It matters for the factors that you cite as having explanatory power over the outcome of interest. So suppose you're interested in a prey that is startled by a predator or attacked by a predator, and it instantaneously engages in a flight or fight response, or you have a reflex that's operating very quickly or any other kind of behavioral outcome that's operating on this quicker kind of instantaneous time scale. In the case of this prey, if you want to explain that fight or flight response, you can explain that by appealing to the enzymes and the metabolites that are already present in the system and that operate on that time scale. You can't explain it by appealing to the genes because it takes them minutes to produce their outcome, right? They're not operating on the same time scale. However, if you want to explain why the enzymes are already there to begin with, why there's a pool that's available, then you can appeal to genes. So part of what I'm suggesting here is that one rationale for selecting causes that are more explanatory than others is that they operate within a time scale of interest. And in many cases, slow causes can get dropped out of the picture because they're not even operating within this time scale. In many cases, the time scale is baked into the explanatory target, right? Or it need, or it should be. So if a scientist is specifying an explanatory target, right, time scale is either kind of already there implicitly or it should be made explicit. Second reason for why this distinction matters, control, right? Causes that operate on different time scales give you very different types of control over the world. Suppose you have two drugs and they both cause pain relief, but one of them gives you pain relief in two minutes. The other gives you pain relief in two hours. If you have a patient who is going to have maximum pain in two minutes, you wanna give the first. If you have a patient who's going to experience maximum pain in two hours and you need to start the dosage now, you're gonna to wanna to give the second, right? A helpful thing that this helps capture is that speed, and these distinctions within causation, they involve features that are objective and that are parts of causes in the world. So causes in the world operate on different timescales and I don't get to control what that is. That's a feature of causes in the world. The thing that I get to determine is which of the causes I target, right? And I can choose different ones depending on the kind of control, the speed of control that I want, right? Third reason for why speed matters. There's actually two here. A first reason is that if you wanna capture how scientists study causal systems, there's really interesting challenges that show up if the causal system operates on different timescales. If a scientist is studying a system that's operating on the time scale of nanoseconds, there's a lot of extra challenges for being able to detect the effect on that short of a timescale. And alternatively, if a scientist is studying a system that operates on the geological timescale, right, I mean, that's gonna involve its own host of other challenges. The causal process itself is longer than the time scale the scientists studying it. Of course, there's many strategies that are involved in getting around that challenge, but if we wanna understand how scientists are studying causal systems, right? How they do, how they should, but in many cases they're doing it as they should, um, speed matters, speed of the causal process matters. And a fourth reason, one thing that we see and have learned from cognitive psychology is that as humans, we are biased against slow causes. So if there are two causes that both produce the outcome with the same likelihood, they're equally stable, but one of them happens much faster, the other happens much slower, when we look at the slow cause, we often say, that's not really, it's not really causal. 
It's not paradigmatically causal. The quick one gets viewed as, oh yeah, that's causality. The slow one is like, no, mm, not going to accept that. And they produce the outcome with the same likelihood, right? Why does this matter? If we wanna communicate slow causal processes to the public, it's really important to know that they and we, right? There's often this bias against viewing slow causal processes as genuinely causal. So climate change, right? If you wanna communicate the spread of COVID through the population, right? Very stable causal relationships that are very likely to produce an outcome, but much slower, right? So important to keep this in mind when communicating about causality to the public. This is the first distinction. Um, here's a really nice diagram that helps capture it as well. This is a diagram from Bassett and Sporns, captures different time scales of interest in the context of neuroscience. Part of what I've suggested is that we often see the time scale of interest in the effect that scientists are focused on, the effect they want to explain. We often call that the explanatory target in philosophy of science. In other cases, you're interested in a candidate cause and you start there first, right? In each case, there's often a time scale that you're interested in from the beginning. Second distinction within causation and causal type is what I call material continuity. Material continuity refers to a case where a cause is transmitting material to its effect. And really nice example of this is that metabolic pathway, the very top of this slide. In the metabolic pathway, you've got material from metabolite one, it's moving into metabolite two, much of this is moving into the three and into four. Metabolic pathways are often analogized to factory assembly lines, and you can see the same thing. If you have a factory assembly line where there's a car that's built at the end, you start with a car frame, car frame, there's some material that's moving through the sequence of steps, right? Further on in the analogy is you take the car frame, you add the doors, you add the wheels, you bend some stuff, then you get a car, right? Metabolite one, you start with metabolite one, you add some stuff, you splice, you bind, you break it in half, and then at the very end, you get the metabolite of interest. So what's interesting is that some causal relationships and processes involve material continuity, they involve the reliable flow of material. Not all causal relationships have this feature. I think probably many of them don't. I think this is somewhat uncommon. An example of a causal process that doesn't have this feature is a sequence of dominoes that fall over in succession. So you could have 20 dominoes lined up in series, you topple the first, they all fall over. Reliable, genuine, real causal process. But there's no material that starts with the first domino that reliably moves through the sequence of causal steps. There's momentum, right? We talk about causal influence moving through, but in this case, we're interested in material that's reliably moving through from domino one all the way to domino 20. Why does this matter? Um, why is this something we should care about? Well, scientists have realized that some causal systems and processes have this feature and they exploit it in studying them. So one way that they do this is they introduce a tag or a tracer into the material, the very beginning, and then they follow it as it moves through the sequence of causal steps. So they'll introduce a radioactive tracer into metabolic pathways. They'll introduce dyes into neural pathways. In ecological pathways, they do the same thing with a radioactive tracer, and then they follow it as it moves through the sequence of causal steps. If you are studying a causal process that doesn't have this feature, this is a method that's not available, right? So another reason for why these causal types matter is they matter for the methods that scientists use to study causal systems. Another reason, second reason, for why material continuity matters is it captures a different type of control that you can get over a system or over the world. If you want to control the microstructure of the effect, target a cause with material continuity. If you wanna control whether that car is made out of steel or plastic or styrofoam, you're going to target a cause with material continuity with the downstream outcome. There is a type of causation side note that Aristotle discusses and it's called, it's similar to this, it's called material causation. And there's a, an example that's used to capture this. And it is a sculptor and a block of marble. 
and then a sculpture that's made out of marble. So the sculptor and the block of marble are two causes and both of them work together to produce this sculpture that's made out of marble. If you want to control the microstructure of that statue, you don't mess with the sculptor, you mess with the block of marble, right? Instead of giving them that block of marble, you swap it out for granite, right? And then you control the microstructure of the, of the downstream product. So similarity here between that notion of causation and what's referred to as material continuity here. Third reason it's related to this, if you want to explain the microstructure of the product, or if you want to explain certain features that it is responsible for or related to, like buoyancy, whether it's magnetic. And in these cases, you care about the microstructure of the effect. Targeting and referring to a cause with material continuity is relevant for you here for explaining that. Okay, third type. This is the third type we'll discuss in detail and then we'll pan out. A third distinction or type of causation that matters here um, and that shows up in neuroscience as we'll see is that some causes produce their effects reversibly and others produce their effects irreversibly. This refers to the ability of a cause to undo its effect. So a really nice example of reversible causation is the light switch on the wall and the lights in the room. I can turn the switch on, the lights turn on, turn the switch off, the light turn off, turn it back on, the lights turn on. I, it's reversible, right? You can do it over and over again. Not all causal relationships have that feature. In some cases, they're irreversible. Nice example, if I have a glass face on the counter, I accidentally knock it over, it falls on the ground and it breaks. There's no way for me to undo my hitting of the vase such that I can restore that glass vase back to its original state, right? So part of what we're referring to here are causes that you can re-intervene on to restore that effect back to its original state. I gave us two ordinary life examples. How about a science example, right? In particular from neuroscience. Think of a disease like PKU, phenylketonuria. This gives us a nice example of irreversible causation. Here you have a mutated gene. It produces a mutated non-functional enzyme. Part of what this means is you're no longer getting this conversion of metabolite two to three, you get a buildup of two. In some cases, if you have a buildup of metabolite, it's toxic. If it's there long enough, it can cause damage, like brain damage. This is what happens in PKU. Um, if it's around for long enough, even if you reduce levels of this metabolite, the brain damage results. So we know that in some cases, if neurons in the brain are damaged, right, this can reduce their functionality permanently, or it can result in death. And there's no coming back from those states. This is an example of irreversible causation in neuroscience and neurobiology that is involved in pathophysiology or a disease. There are also examples of irreversible causation when things are going just fine, uh, normal functioning. Examples are apoptosis, programmed cell death, or cases where you have stem cell differentiation, right? In some cases, the way we understand some stem cell differentiation is when a cell differentiates, there's no going back, right? There are, of course, many examples of reversible causal relationships in neurobiology, neuroscience, biology. Gene expression is one of them. Um, be interesting to think of whether most causal relationships that neuroscientists are interested in are reversible. Um, a little bit more on this. So one thing that we see is that in everyday life and in scientific contexts, we're very careful with causal relationships that are irreversible. We're careful because we don't want to accidentally trigger them and produce their effects because there's no going back, they're permanent. This is why in everyday life contexts, we have seatbelt laws, helmet laws, poison control companies. We know that if you inflict certain types of damage to the human body, there's no going back from it, unfortunately, right? Death is irreversible. So we're often very careful with irreversible causal relationships. If it's reversible, less so. You're not worried about me accidentally hitting the wall and turning the light switch off. We'll just turn it right back on, right? But there's some precautions to make sure I don't accidentally, you know, walk out the window or something like that. Uh, control, right? This also captures a very different type of control 
over the world. You can control whether something is permanent, right? You control whether a state is something that you can't come back from. Toy, ordinary life example, you have a um, city of villagers who's ruled by a tyrant king. They all conspire to poison the king. They poison him, the king dies. It's convenient for them that they don't have to worry about him coming back to life, right? It's an irreversible causal relationship. If you think of the manufacture of artifacts, they're often manufactured so that they have reversible causal relationships. So in some cases, reversible causal relationships are useful to us. They give us a kind of control we want. The toaster that we have, the oven, the car, the light switch, these are all designed to involve reversible causal relationships. We want to use them over and over again. If I could only use my toaster once, right, I wouldn't, that wouldn't work well for us. So this, again, captures very different types of control that we have over the world um, and that are kept in mind when artifacts are designed and that matter for thinking about living systems. It also matters for how we study these systems. One thing that Woodward and I discuss in the paper down here is that in many causal modeling techniques, there's often the assumption that the causal relationship is reversible. If it's not, this is a problem because then you won't pick it up as a genuine causal relationship. So third distinction, whether causes are reversible or irreversible. So three different types of causation that I've discussed in some kind of fine grain detail. How should we understand these? What's going on here? How do these fit into that picture of all this interest in defining causation? One thing I'm going to suggest is that a helpful way to capture these is by separating out different features of causality. So if you think of a causal system or a causal relationship, candidate causal relationship, candidate causal system, there's of course different questions we can ask. We might wanna ask, is the relationship causal? Do I have real causality? In other cases, you might want to ask, what other features does it have? If you're interested in this first question, you're interested in what I call primary features of causation. Primary features of causation are features that make the relationship causal. This is what captures the characteristic features of causality. When you see these, you know it's causal. The philosophical accounts of causation, this is what they're interested in. This is what they're trying to capture, right? So for Hume, the regularity account, the primary feature of causation for Hume is you have a regularity in the world. And then once you have that, bam, you know you have causation. If you're interested in this second question, you're interested in something different. You're interested in what I call secondary features of causation. These are features that matter, they're relevant for the causal behavior of the system, but they don't make it causal. You do not hang your hat on these when you wanna ask the question and know, is this a causal system? So here's where we have these distinctions. This is what we're talking about. This is the, there's a huge landscape of different types of causal systems. And we'll start to look at more of them, but these are secondary features of causation. To give a little bit more of a picture of this, think of material flow. You can find material flow in the world, but it doesn't mean you have causation. There are some, types of material flow that we don't view as causality. And in other cases, you have real causality, but you don't have material flow. So material flow, it's not a primary feature of causation, right? It's a secondary feature. It's the extra bells and whistles that causal relationships and causal systems have. Mm -hmm. There's a really nice quote from Mackey that I think helpfully captures this, the bells and whistles, the frills of causal relationships. Mackey states, I would rather say that there is a single basic concept of causing to which various frills are added. There is one common kind of causing, but with different accompaniments. This is a common, this is what's going on here. I think this is a proper way, a helpful way to understand these different types of causes. Many philosophers of science are using um, a single account of causation, the interventionist account, but there's something else going on here, right? We're interested in the frills. We're interested in the bells and whistles here. 
And it's really important to be clear that these don't make a system causal. They're just extra things that matter. Okay. We've only talked about three in detail. There's really a lot more that we can start to lay out if we wanna give a kind of taxonomy of different types. Um, another distinction that's discussed in the philosophical literature, clearly in my opinion, is stability. Causes can differ with respect to how stable they are. They can differ with respect to specificity. There's at least two different things that are meant by specificity. They can differ with respect to proportionality. This is another distinction. I mentioned how causes are organized with respect to each other. They can be organized in a linear chain, the bow tie, the feedback loop. These are again, right, distinctions, different types of causal systems. And then I also mentioned mechanisms, pathways, and cascades. So here's more of the landscape. How do we understand these? I think there's a way to kind of sort these um, that helps us get a bigger picture understanding of the landscape. The ones I have in the first column are ones that you can see at a single causal step. They might take place over many causal steps, but you can define them and see them at a single step. The second type, you can't see these at a single step. They have to do with how steps are organized, the arrangements. So I call the first type types of causal influence, the second types of causal topologies. The third type is more complex causal systems. Uh, in some cases, these are built up out of the first two categories, um, and they involve many features. This is not exhaustive. I'm sure there are many other types in each category. I wouldn't be surprised if it's helpful to add more categories to this. But this is a starting point in laying out different types of causes, causal relationships, and causal systems. I'll say a little bit more now about the mechanism, pathway, and cascade. If you're familiar with philosophy of neuroscience, you know that the biggest causal concept in town is mechanism. <laughs> uh, the dominant view of how explanations work in neuroscience is that they are mechanistic. A uh, very dominant view. It's been dominant since 2000. The paper that published this in 2000 in my field, it's the most cited paper in one of our top journals. There's two top journals. In one of those, it's still the most cited paper. So according to a large majority of philosophers of neuroscience, the way that explanation works in neuroscience is it involves citing mechanisms, a kind of causal structure. Huge literature on this. There are different accounts of mechanism. Here is one common account. Common account is that mechanism is a term that refers to a particular kind of causal system with at least three main features. It's a causal system that's hierarchical. You can see this black and white abstract representation of it. You've got lower level causal parts. They interact together to produce a higher level outcome of the system. Think of mechanisms of signal propagation. You've got ions, you've got ion channels, their density, lower level details, they produce a higher level behavior. Second, fine grain detail. Sparse network model doesn't count. A monocausal model definitely won't count. You need detail. You need lots of information. Third, you need mechanical interactions. It isn't enough to just say that X is a cause of Y. You need to say how it causes Y. Often with force, action, and motion, it bends, pushes, pulls, compresses. This mechanism concept is often analogized to machines, the notion of a machine. See this in the language, sometimes in scientific literature. A, an excellent um, overview of mechanism and how it's discussed in philosophy of science is provided by Holly Anderson. She has two papers here, Field Guide to Mechanisms 1 and 2, covers a lot of the literature in this field. Um, philosophers of neuroscience have motivated this picture of how explanation works in neuroscience by the fact that neuroscientists often use the term mechanism in their work. They view this as a good reason to view this as the way explanations work. One, one disadvantage of this, or one thing they haven't noticed, is that mechanism is just one causal concept that neuroscientists use. They use many others. Another causal concept that's often found in neuroscience is the notion of pathways, right? 
there's an interest in neural pathways, neural circuits, signaling pathways. In this case, um, there's often a different kind of causal structure that's of interest. Pathways, pathway is a term that is often used to refer to causal systems that are much more abstract. Think of circuit diagrams, wiring diagrams. Here's a stem cell differentiation pathway, a set of them. You do not have the mechanistic details and you don't need to know them to get lots of helpful explanations from this. So uh, you can see there's four features here, two most important ones, abstract, super abstract, right? You can represent developmental pathways for a whole, whole organism in three or four steps, right? And that's all you need to get certain types of explanations and flow. There's a focus on something moving along the sequence of steps. We see this in language of um, pipes, of conduits, um, the common analogy um, you right, these are already analogies. Others are roadways, highways. So mechanism is analogized to machine, lower level parts. Pathway is often analogized to roadways, highways, city streets. You have a pipe with something flowing. It's also the case that in these diagrams, scientists also refer to them as roadmaps of metabolic pathways or roadmaps of development. And this helps capture how different this is from a mechanism. When you have a roadmap, you don't have information about gears that grind together to produce a single outcome. It's a possibility space. It shows you where you can move in this space and where you can't move, right? So if you pick any downstream outcome, it shows you how you could have gotten there. And if you pick any upstream one, it tells you where you can go and where you can't go. You have, and in many cases, you don't need to know the lower level mechanistic details. This is a macro level causal structure. Pathways, of course, not the only causal concept that's used. Another one is cascades. Examples here are cell signaling cascades, ischemic cascades in the brain, avalanches, neural avalanches is a similar thing. The most important feature of cascades is amplification. These guys explode. So you have a small cause, produces an explosive huge amount of some effect. The analogy here, right? Mechanism is analogized to machines, pathways analogized to roadways. Cascade is the snowball effect, the ripple effect. Cascades, they're literally named for a waterfall where you have a small amount of water and it fans out. And the diagrams that scientists use capture this. They're one to many, right? Small cause, many different effects, explosive effects. There's at least two types of amplification that we find. In some cases, you amplify a single product, like an enzyme cascade, a lot of one enzyme, blood coagulation. In other cases, you amplify in the sense of producing many different effects. Disaster cascades is an example. Um, another example of this is the spread of COVID through the population. So at my university, we were sent this diagram in the very beginning of the pandemic. And the mascot at my university is an anteater. And his name is Peter. So this is Peter's cautionary tale. Part of what this diagram is intended to show us is that one person with COVID can transmit it to two people. They can each transmit it to two more and two more and two more until you get the ballooning out of this disease in the population. If you want to communicate the threat in the manner of spread of COVID through the population, you shouldn't call it a mechanism. You should call it a cascade. Cascade better captures the amplification, the ballooning out, the threat and the manner of spread of this disease. And that is often exactly what we want to communicate, right? Not only that, but mechanism is often very reductive. Here, there's something different that we're intended, we're, we're intending to highlight about the causal system. So the causal concepts we use matter for science communication, matters for communicating causality to different audiences. Okay, in conclusion, why does this matter? It matters for explanation. It matters for explaining different types of unique behaviors of the system. Do you have explosive amplification? Are you focused on a single outcome? It matters for causal selection. It matters for the factors that you select as producing the outcome of interest. We saw this with speed, right? In some cases, you're going to select factors on the basis of the time scale on which they operate. Matters for control. Causes that give you irreversible control 
give you a very different type of control over the world, right? Same with causes that operate on different time scales. This also matters for capturing how scientists study and identify causal systems. You can use tagging and tracer techniques if you have the feature of material continuity. If you don't, these methods are often not on the table. Matters for communication about causality, right? The terms that we use um, in the sense in which they pick out features of the system of interest. And finally, it matters for capturing causal complexity in the world, right? These are actual objective distinct features of causes, causal relationships and causal systems, right? If we wanna capture the unique challenges that scientists face in grappling with this kind of diversity and this kind of complexity, they matter for understanding that kind of causal study. They matter for causal reasoning, right? And they matter for capturing causation in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, We have time for questions. Online, offline, please. Um, so uh, I'm trying to kind of give voice to you of the uh, biologists that are pushing problems. We seem to really be all about their people. Uh, and I'm thinking that, you know, they might acknowledge that, well, yeah, I mean, certain systems, pathway language, cascade language, seem to get captured some of the causal uh, process of interest. Uh, and, but really, what we're all about is, like you say, mechanism driver for, you know, maybe process through the cell in the pathway to really understand, uh, the, you know, what really brings about the cascade and things like that. And so they might say that uh, there are times when we have pathway, we have an understanding of a pathway, but unless we understand the mechanism that drives you know, uh, uh, the things along the pathway, we really don't have um, uh, 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 a grip on it. Um, Oh, sure, yeah, uh, oh, very nice question. And I'll restate it um, since I have the mic on me and I'll pull up a picture of a mechanism. Yeah, this is a, um, I mean, excellent question and one that uh, mechanists ask and that we really should ask and have a good answer for. So the question is, why not view these other causal structures or other causal systems as really mechanisms if you go down deep enough, or another way to perhaps frame this question is, well, okay, uh, but mechanisms are more explanatory. Like you have the higher level pathway, but if if I want the real, you know, shebang explanation, you know, don't we want the mechanism in science? So there's two things I would say to this. And one of them is, the challenges with the mechanism picture, one of the main challenges is this is super reductive. Part of what you're saying is if you want to explain something, guess where the causes are? They're all down below. We think in many cases that there are higher level causes that explain and that matter for outcomes of interest. So if we want to capture social causes, if we want to capture environmental causes in medicine, it's sometimes referred to as downward causation that ain't gonna do it, right? Because they're not at a lower scale. So examples of this are differences in blood pressure, differences in cortisol levels um, that are experienced by different groups that experience racism differently, right? Um, there are certain environmental conditions that are captured with higher scale variables that we think are really important causes in explaining outcomes. And this fails to capture those causes. So that's one That's one reason. In the context of medicine, this is often referred to as uh, sometimes social structure or structural factors, structural causes. And there's an increased interest in capturing them and paying attention to them. Uh, a second reason 
is that in some cases, you can have a pathway that is this more abstract causal structure. And that pathway is present across many different systems, but the lower level mechanisms that instantiate the pathway are highly different. So the glycolytic pathway, glycolysis is one example of this. It's a conserved pathway. It's shared across almost all species on the planet. The same 10 steps of the process are the same. But if you look at the mechanisms, the enzymes, at even just one step of this metabolic pathway, the enzymes are wildly different across all of the systems, even different organs of our body. So in some cases, if you want to explain a type level outcome or like why this outcome presents across many systems, sometimes you can't give mechanistic detail because the causes aren't shared at a lower scale, they're shared at a higher one. Another way to capture this is uh, I sometimes say, causal explanation isn't a game of how low can you go, it's a game of what gives you control. So often the factors with control are at a higher scale. Otherwise, you know, we might have a problem in neuroscience and biology for the physicists who want to claim then, well, you didn't, you know, give me some quantum stuff. That's not, but causation and causal explanation here is being understood in terms of control. The COVID virus gives pretty good control over that disease. We don't yet have a nice quantum level explanation of that. So that those are those are two. Um, points that I would suggest both higher level causes and capturing their influence on lower level outcomes. And then also the fact that some of these macro scale causal structures are instantiated by different mechanisms or they're multiply realized by different mechanisms in philosopher of science terminology. Thanks for the talk. Um, can I ask a question about the uh, slide? Where you have the taxonomy with the um, second category being taxonomy. Yeah. I, I was thinking about one of the distinctions you mentioned at the beginning, but then you turn on it, the uh, proximal vision discord. And, and I have a little bit of difficulty in understanding why the third group uh, or how it how this differs from the first two. And I was trying to find where that distinction falls in almost. So the question is, um, with respect to the distinction between causes that are proximal and distal, where are we going to put them in this taxonomy? I. It's a great question, and there's there's other distinctions uh, that it would be interesting to try to fit here too. Of course causes that are necessary or sufficient. This gets a lot of attention in scientific context. That's complicated for various reasons. My inclination is to put them in the second causal topology category because the suggestion is that in order to fit in the first category, you have to be able to see it at a single step. And of course, distal causes, you can't see it a single step. And so to capture that difference, I think you do need a linear chain or at least many steps. But it's a nice example of how maybe even that distinction doesn't as nicely fit into these columns as some of the others. Um, but that is um, a next and an important area for work is to um, figure out. There's also a sense in which this is like a bit abstract um, of given examples that are connecting it up with concrete scientific cases, but um, yeah. Uh, important to think about this more, fleshing it out, and really analyzing the columns and categories more. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I was wondering how, how uh, to understand the end house uh, of, of some kind of Like when you question, I mean, when you um, try to get deeper into the house, you end up in the kind of fundamentals of the universe, I suppose. <laughs> like, well, well, what, what, uh, what's the definition of the ethical uh, Good. So the question is, how do how do we identify the end cause? Okay, good. 
uh, how do we, um, so one way in which this question is phrased is in terms of like infinite regress. If you think of some outcome you want to explain, suppose it's a disease outcome, there's a sense in which you can regress in two ways. You can go really far back in the causal history, right? Patient has this disease, there's a malfunctioning protein produced by an enzyme, produced by their mom who has, you know, grandmas here, and you keep going back to the big bang, right? That's one way to go all the way back, right? Now, when you go to the hospital, physicians or medical researchers, neuroscientists don't cite the Big Bang and all of their explanations. You know, you're not giving the complete explanation. That's one regress. The other is you go down, right? You have this gene, the chemical understanding of it, go down to physics, go down to fundamental physics. Um, why aren't you going all, all the way down? So there's going deep down and there's going far back in the causal history. The way to get out of the regress, in my opinion, is first, you need to be very clear about what the explanatory target is. And it has to have a contrast. You want to explain why the patient has this disease versus not having the disease is one example. And if that's your outcome of interest, what you're searching for is a cause that gives you control over that. If you're interested in whether a patient has this disease or not, citing grandma is not gonna help uh, and the Big Bang won't help either. Because if you think of intervening on either of those and turning them on or off, if you turn off the Big Bang, it never happened. Well, yeah, the patient never has the disease, uh, but we're not interested, the patient's dead, right? <laughs> uh, we're interested in the disease in a living patient is another way to put it. So you're looking for a factor that gives you control over on of the disease and off of the disease in a living patient. If you intervene on grandma, you don't get that fine grained control. Um, if, you, you know, if, if you intervene on the Big Bang, you don't get that control either. Um, another way to think about this is oxygen is a necessary factor in the environment, but that's also not a cause of the disease. So if you think of Huntington's disease, you can intervene. So oxygen is necessary for the patient, right? But if you change whether they have oxygen or not, you control whether the patient lives or dies. That's not the explanatory target. You want to explain why they have the disease versus not in a living patient. So there's actually a very precise explanatory target that scientists are interested in. The way to stop the regress is you're looking for the cause that gives you control over that special target. Um, how do you stop the regress going down? Hey, once we find quantum fundamental physics that gives us control over these uh, disease outcomes, I'm sure we'll be open to viewing that as the causal explanation for them, but we don't have that yet. What we have are in cases where you have uh, an explanation that is accepted in the community. You often have a causal factor. It's at a higher scale, but it's one that does give you the kind of control over the outcome. So a first point that I think is helpful from philosophy of science is before you ever play the explanation game or like what explains what or what causes what, you have to be so precise about what it is that is being explained. What's the explanatory target? And it involves a contrast and um, also agreeing on the definition for the behavior, the trait, the phenotype. And only then can you search for and identify the cause or causes that matter the most. Uh, so they ask, which is found and why an reversible slash irreversible feature is conceptualized as a secondary causal explanation and not a primary one? Perfect. It's not, so the question is, why is the distinction between reversible and irreversible causation not a primary feature of causation? Um, why did I label it as a secondary feature of causation? The reason is that primary features of causation should capture the essence or the characteristic features of causation, what makes something causal. And we don't expect all causes to be either reversible or to be irreversible. We allow both types. So it doesn't look like either reversibility once you have it means you have causality or that irreversibly means you have causality. It's, it's a secondary feature because it isn't involved in how we define causation. That's the, that's the suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Last question for you. Uh, is this a follow-up to the previous uh, yeah. question? Um, so the idea about having uh, um, control on some sort of uh, target, uh, but only that 
Yes, absolutely. So um, to be even more precise about how you would go about selecting the main explanatory causes, there is the step of identifying the target of interest. In cases of a disease outcome, um, suppose it's the presence of Huntington's disease or the absence of it, that's the contrast. And you want to explain that in a living patient. Um, if you think about grandma, right, you can turn grandma on or you can turn grandma off. If you turn grandma off, it, there's no there's no patient, right? And that's not the contrast of interest. It's a patient that either has the disease or doesn't. So if you think of the gene and if you can intervene on the gene early in the patient's life, then you could remove the trinucleotide repeat or introduce it. You Then you get control over both sides of that contrastive focus. And I guess part of the point is in a living patient. This is why some of these toy examples that philosophers are interested in where you can like uh, include, it looks like there's all of these causes. So a match lighting, is it caused by striking of the match or the oxygen in the room? It looks like they're both causes, but why do we cite the striking of the match? If you look at cases in science, they don't always have that puzzling feature because the explanatory target is a little more precise. It's um, a disease in a living patient. So fussing with some of these other factors it gives you control, I mean, it, it annihilates the patient, <laughs> right? Um, which is um, hooked up to a different explanatory target. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Last question. Oh, um, in the real world of, <clears throat> say, product development, pharmacological product development, um, you've given me a, a, a new way to, to, to perceive um, that ecosystem. And, and I wonder what your thoughts are when watching TV show and on some of the ads, on some of the ads for a drug, and it just seems increasingly common that there's a listing of 47 different symptoms to you know by which you should not um, you know, avoid taking product X if you experience this, and that seems to me to be to really reflect some um, flaw in approach at, at the experimental level for the, the sanctioning of uh, drug X. Um, and I wonder what, what your thoughts are on that in a higher level uh, you know, picture. Is, is how, how do you interpret that? So there's two things that um, I think are really interesting about this. The first is that this situation where you have a single cause that produces many effects, this is often referred to as a kind of specificity or lack of specificity. So in some cases, you might have a cause that produces one effect or a cause that produces many. The concept of pleiotrophy in genetics, where you have one gene that causes many effects, it's nonspecific in the sense that of specificity is like one effect non-specific, you've got a whole bunch. So it's it's probably hard to find cases where a cause produces just one effect. <laughs> it's pretty easy to find many things it could produce. This is an example of where you can give that kind of causal structure a name and uh, of course show why it matters um, if you're interested in treating or targeting one outcome, but all of these others that are produced are undesirable. That's not going to be beneficial. Um, another interesting thing that it reminds me of is that um, there are interesting cases where the name that something is given changes how people act around it. So um, Benjamin, uh, the name will come to me, but there um, is a linguist who, Wharf. yes, Benjamin Wharf, thank you. Um, he was a, so, of course, became very well known in linguistics. Earlier in his career, he was an insurance salesman. And one thing he noticed is that there were more often accidents around um, objects that had innocuous names. Like if you had a flammable object that was called like a stone, like limestone, or if you had a drum that had flammable stuff in it, but it was called an empty drum, people were more cavalier and they'd throw their cigarette buds and knock stuff over. So the name that something has changes how an individual acts around it. In this case, it was associated with accidents. 
So yeah, the causal language that we use to refer to things, it doesn't just matter for you know, communicating what's the threat, but it actually changes how people behave. Um, if it has a name that captures that danger versus a name that seems innocuous, we'll act very differently and maybe there's more accidents if it is dangerous but doesn't have that label. But yeah, thank you, Benjamin Worth. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, two things. Number one, uh, this, this talk was recorded, so will be available online at some point in the future. And secondly, we'll have our next uh, presentation seminar in a month, roughly. Uh, Jennifer Ferris, who's actually online, will be presenting. We don't, I don't think we have a title yet, but we can work on that between now and then. Thank you all for showing up, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.